Hello, I am Renato Ambrosio Jr. from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and I'm very happy to collaborate with my friend, Dr. Machine, uh, in this meeting in Morocco. It's been a little over a year that I was there with my wife and we had a great time and I was very impressed with the level of homology that you do. So congratulations for the work you have done and all the progress we have achieved for helping the patients to do the best as possible in ophthalmology. So I'm very happy to share some of my ideas in this course about corneal tomography and biomechanics. And my topic is related to corneal biomechanics and corneal tomography, the multimodal imaging for refractive surgery. So we're going to talk about some features that are related to some uh, companies and I have my financial disclosure listed here, of course, including Oculus and other companies and my colleagues on the brain group, the Brazilian artificial intelligence network in medicine, which is complete in 10 years. I also have many collaborators that I have to, to do give the credit because of the most of the research that we do uh, is uh, connected to some of the of the PhD thesis and, and some work that we have done for research. And it's a very big pleasure and an honor to collaborate with these colleagues uh, also in Brazil and in Portugal. When you think about diagnosis in refractive surgery, you have to think about what you're trying to achieve and you have to know what you have in terms of the technologies for diagnostics and also on what you're trying to achieve in terms of the questions you want to answer. So the watts are optimized planning for refractive surgery. If you do surgery in the cornea, if you do surgery on the lens, if you do fake IOL, if, you, if the procedure is a therapeutic or refractive procedure, if you do surgery on the cornea, it, it's better to do LASIK, SMILE, or PRK. It's important to understand prevention of complications, including ectasia, including tear dysfunction, which is the most common one. And some of these cases with ocular pain, we have interface epithelization and also quality of vision symptoms. And how we do that? We do that with the diagnostics. Starting from anamnesis, the, ask, the, the questions you ask the patient, how are you doing? How can I help you? It starts all there. But you have to go beyond, beyond but not over. You have to do slit lamp. You have to measure the, the central corneal thickness, but we have tomography today. You have to look at the front surface topography, but the three dimension can give you more shape information. Nevertheless, you have ocular surface imaging, which is related to the placebo disc topography. You have ocular wavefront that can be combined with cornea wavefront, quality of vision. You have axial biometry is very important. Segmental tomography with epithelial layer and endothelial layer evaluation. Corneal biomechanics, of course. The evaluation of corneal cells with endothelium and confocal microscopy. And eventually in the future, we will see more and more about genetics. <clears throat> These are the hows. And the hows are related to multimodal imaging. It's very important that we understand the nomenclature and why we are trying to do that. We are trying to do that because we have to go beyond but not over, enhancing the screening for ectasia risk. It's not the same as managing patients with disease in which you have definitely breaking paradigm. So screening for susceptibility for ectasia, which is what we want when we do a refractive candidate evaluation is different than diagnosing and staging keratoconus and corneoctasia. It's very important to understand that the follow-up is also going to be important. And a therapeutic procedure is definitely not the same as a refractive procedure, even though we have a lot of similarities. The first report on ectasia was from Theo Silent in 1998 after LASIK. And those first cases were with high myopia that had a huge impact from the procedure that decompensated the cornea. A few months later, in 1998 again, he published the atrogenic ectasia after foam fruit keratoconus, so-called foam fruit keratoconus based on anterior surface curvature with the inferior stiffening uh, uh, and the irregular astigmatism. These two cases allude to the pathophysiology of the corneal ectasia, which is related to corneal resistance and the impact from the environment in which eye rubbing plays a major role. Of course, laser vision correction procedures do weaken the cornea, but if you want to avoid ectasia, tell the patients not to rub the eye. And this is part of the campaign that we have 
that we understand that any coin may develop ectasia and we have to tell the patients not to rub the eye. It's not the only factor, but it's a major factor. And again, I'll come with a very important concept that eye rubbing or scratching the eye or sleeping over the eye aggravates keratoconus and eventually can cause ectasia. These are not the same thing, even though they look very much the same in some of these patients. And we will allude to the evolving of the understanding that we have so that we can get a differentiation from keratoconus and corneal ectasia. Of course, every keratoconus is a corneal ectasia, but not every corneal ectasia is related to keratoconus, even though they may look like keratoconus sometimes in both eyes. Ectasia assessment after uh, uh, for LASIK, ectasia is, was very nicely uh, accomplished with the ectasia risk score system that was published by Brad Runderman in 2008 for the first time. And he includes topography as the most important criteria. And he has normal symmetrical bow tie, asymmetric bow tie, inferior stiffening with skew radio axis, and eventually the abnormality that he calls form through skewed cones. We'll allude a little more and deeper in this concept of what is form through skewed cones. But in this criteria, he also included age, which is a surrogate of corner biomechanical properties. So what is Fom Fruz Keratoconus? Fom Fruz Keratoconus was first described by Professor Emsler. And we have to first understand that Fom Fruz is not exclusive from ophthalmology. Uh, Dr. Sigmund Freud described some Fom Fruz psychosis. And this is important that we understand that the Fruz is an incomplete abortive form of the disease that can be or not evolving for the full-blown complete disease. When we talk about form through keratoconus in the times that we have today, we have to think about the sensitivity of corneal uh, topography for detecting ectasia, clinical cases uh, that are subsymptomatic. And importantly, 1% of these patients that come as refractive candidates for a clinic, this was done in the 2000-2002 uh, in Seattle, Washington, when I was doing my fellowship, 1% of the cases that come as a refractive candidate, they have keratoconus, and half of these cases would have a normal topography, a normal slit lamp and good vision with this is correct glasses, but they would have a normal topography. So uh, what is from through keratoconus? And this is a very interesting case. The right eye of this patient has a, an abnormal topography with 20-20 distance correct vision and normal slit lamp. The Aaron Rabinovich will call this case as foam fruits keratoconus. Professor Kleiss, Steve Kleiss, in a brilliant editorial in 2009, will come to the concept that the fellow eye of this asymmetric so called unilateral cases may be called the foam fruits keratoconus because they can progress or not. And we have the literature about 60% of these cases with a normal topography do progress with an abnormal topography over time. Interestingly, we have to understand that these cases are very asymmetric. There is no debate about that. But eventually, some of these cases are truly unilateral, and we'll come to this point. And eventually, we have the bilateral frust with both eyes having a normal topography and eventually having a weak cornea. Damien Gatinel had a very nice contribution with this concept that we have topographic criterion of normality and keratoconus. And we can eventually give some objective data to really distinct normal and keratoconus. Suspect and foam fruits are in between here. The suspicious topographies may be normal or may be abnormal. And again, you have to go beyond but not over. Sometimes the understanding of fruits with this concept is very much important because I do believe that the fruits keratoconus is the cases, they are the cases that have a normal topography. Interestingly, in a very nice systematic review on subclinical keratoconus and foam fruits keratoconus on the published reports, uh, Maria Henriquez, she saw a total of 198 and 95 studies on the definition of subclinical keratoconus and foam fruits keratoconus res respectively. And there is a huge variability on the criteria for what is foam fruits and what is subclinical. What is foam fruits? 
I would say there is no consensus. This is a fact. There is no debate about that. We tried to have a consensus in the global consensus in 2015, and there is no consensus that we can achieve for what is from fruit scare the cones. And my humble, my very humble contribution is that from fruit scare the cones is when you have a patient with a very high susceptibility for ectasia progression. High susceptibility doesn't mean it's going to evolve necessarily. So it's important we understand the risk. So the susceptibility for keratoconus or ectasia development. Like in this case that had a subbomal keratomyelosis with a thin flap LASIK in 2008, residual stromal bed 304, the PTA was less than 0.4, and the nice contribution from Marconi Santiago that looked at PTA as a major risk factor for LASIK ectasia. In this case, all look okay, but sometimes when people see this little yellow here with this scale, we would say, hmm, this is a pathognomonic of form fruit keratoconus. I was really frustrated when I heard this comment in one of the meetings back about 10 years ago, and we started a study on the subjective classifications of corneal topography maps. And this is case number six from these 25 cases that we sent to colleagues asking them to classify and then we asked them to classify in the same cases. They didn't know were the same cases, but, they, but we, we sent with a different scale. And again, you see case number six here. And we asked them to classify based on the topographic criteria that was published in the Ectasia Risk Score system. So this is a busy slide, but you will just want to see that the variability was from zero to three with the first scale with a mode of zero. And again, zero to four with a mode of zero in the second scale. Nine out of the 11 classifiers, all these colleagues were experts in refractive surgery, fellowship training, and or scientists related to topography. And nine of the 11 had a different classification with the two scales. So the variability is very important. So we need enhanced objective evaluation. And you have to understand what is topography, front surface evaluation, tomography. So topography with pole with P from PO is different than tomography from M. And we, we, we have to characterize differently the nomenclature. If you do topography with the placido and tomography with the shine flu, go CT, high frequency ultrasound, we have to distinguish those two methods. Tomography gives you the evaluation of the three dimensional architecture of the cornea. Even though the shine flu is the most common method, it's not the only method, especially because of the times of the OCT. When we think about any diagnostics, we have acquisition, parameters, and parameters should be understood in terms of precision and in terms of the accuracy. Uh, precision is the repeatability of the measurement and accuracy refers to the correctness of the measurement with a reference value. These values, these parameters will be displayed into the clinical displays and artificial intelligence may be used to combine the data so that we have a multitude of uh, evaluation with a more accurate uh, diagnosis. Um, this is a quote that I always think about that, that we have to go in a more simple way, but not being simpler. It's very important that we understand that we need objective data. And for example, multimodal imaging with the Pentacam family that is now with Exo Lens and Locker Wavefront, the new, new uh, tools that we have on the market, they will give you machine uh, learning uh, algorithms and some basic algorithms like the histograms for understanding the angle, understanding keratoconus. And this is going to be displayed in more advanced displays like the Bell and Ambrosio display, which has over 10 years now. <clears throat> and the Bell and ABCD, uh, the Bell and ABCD is for progression of keratoconus in which you look at the difference between the first measurement and the second measurement if this change is statistically significant, considering the repeatability, the precision of the measurement of the A, anterior curvature at the thinnest point, B, posterior curvature at the thinnest point, C is the thinnest point, and D is distance correct visual acuity. It's important to include the D because it gives you a very nice information about how the patient is doing. Michael Belling has a superb contribution with the elevation maps. Elevation maps is a hard concept, but very quickly, I would just describe that this is a subtraction map between the actual shape that was measured, could be front or back surface of the cornea, and a reference that can be used 
so that you see if it's a higher value or a lower value from this reference on the measured surface. Michael Bellin had the idea of excluding an area surrounding the thinnest point, 3.5 millimeters in diameter, it can change a little bit in some situations, but if you have a difference between the enhanced sphere that is calculated and the standard sphere with the eight millimeters with no exclusion zone, you have a protrusion in this area and you can see the normal, the suspicious and the abnormal considering normal population studies. Well, I think you may be a little bit confused with elevation. I was, and my understanding of elevation was the front surface of the cornea is referenced to the back surface of the cornea. So one to each other, you have the thickness map and the thinning of the cornea is the hallmark of ectasia. And if you see with the ectasia progression you have thinning and protrusion. And the idea is to characterize the normal thin cornea and the abnormal thinned cornea. So thinned over the spatial resolution and thin over the time, which is something you don't have with the measurement of today. You can have a different subtraction maps from the measurements on the, on, the, on the past. If you have this available, that's great. But if you don't have, if you've seen the patient for the first time, you can imply from the spatial variation of the thinnest point towards the periphery, you can imply the time domain. So the 3D going to the understanding of the 4D, which is time. So that's our thickness profile graphs. Here you have the thinnest point and here you have zero because the thinnest point is 0% higher than the thinnest point and you have the graphs considering the normal population. Here you have three different cases and you can see this is a normal cornea. You can see this is a, there is escape on the PTI, the percentage of thickness increase with a mild keratoconus pattern. And here you can see also in the Scheinflug imaging, you can see some of uh, some anomalies, some density of the, of the stroma in the anterior stromal uh, part of the cornea. It's very interesting to look at that as well. And also here you have a gute, which has a second hump sign of the camo in the densitometry that we just discussed in a little bit, but you have a thicker uh, periphery uh, and a thicker center, so the, the progression is attenuated. And if you don't have the graphs, it's hard to take this information from just a very, very well-trained eye who see those in the, in the color code maps. So going back to the case of ectasia, you have this situation and the Bell and Ambrosio display will come with some indices, the ectasia susceptibility. This patient doesn't have keratoconus. The patient has a normal slit lamp, has 20-20 or even better distance correct vision. Topography is not abnormal. So this patient had ectasia susceptibility. The impact from the procedure, even though it was acceptable with a good residual stromal bed, was not accepted by the cornea. It was about, there was about mechanical decompensation. So the bad D, and this is the threshold levels uh, around 1.3 to 1.6, and the art max lower than uh, 400, around 400, 394, 412. Those are different studies that we can do for clinical keratoconus, subclinical keratoconus, and those are uh, the, that's, the, that's why we have a variability on the threshold here. Interestingly, we have some literature that supports the accuracy of the Bell and Ambrosio display. Uh, this myoectasia case from Elmagar, he sent us uh, the, the data from the U12 files and we were able to look at this case in detail. And you have here right and left eyes with different scales and you see the pattern. The pattern is irregular and this is a keratoconus with a low keratometric value. And in fact, 10% of the keratoconus cases in over 2000 patients that we have seen they have a lower keratometry than 47.6 with about 6% with lower than 45. So it's important to understand that keratoconus may occur despite of a relatively normal or low keratometry. Understanding risk of ectasia, we have to understand the literature and the experience from colleagues. This very nice experience from uh, Steve Schauhorn with 300,000 lazy procedures performed between 2007 and 2011. We have normal cases developing ectasia, actually 10% of the ectasia cases. And we have also 1% of the stable with abnormal topography. So we ask about the specificity. 
And looking at the studies that we have done over time, we have a cohort of international colleagues sending us cases from the pre-op. And this patient comes very nicely. This was done by one of the best corner surgeons in the planet, and the patient is still stable. Look at the irregular topography. The patient has a normal topography and tomography after surgery with over 10 years of follow-up. And retrospectively, in 2008, we didn't have the belly ambrosio, but we can get the data and retrospectively calculate that will be an enhanced specificity example for the case. So the conundrum ectasia is now 20 years. And we have a very nice study from Eastern Europe from Dr. Bohak in which she looked at the 300,000, at 30,000, 30,000 lazy procedures and she got 10 cases of ectasia and only three had a residual stromal bed lower than 300 and only two uh, PTA higher than 40%. So we need to go beyond. And the topography was relatively normal in most of these cases. So when we have our study with 3,278, one eye randomly selected for per patient and 105 cases of ectasia, we have uh, the IS value as a very specific because colleagues, they tend not to do surgery in patients with irregular topography with a, 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 with a symmetry between the superior and inferior parts of the cornea. But this would detect only 22.9% of the cases. The bad D, which was not considering when these surgeries were done, would be sensitive to detect 59% if you have a cutoff of 1.5 with a specificity of 90%. Uh, you can change, you can improve the sensitivity, but you definitely decrease the specificity. My colleague and friend, Dr. Bernardo Lopez, did a very nice thesis in, he, in which he looked at objective parameters, looking at the AI so that we have, including the very asymmetric ectasia cases and some of the ectasia cases, we have a better AI. So we developed the Pentacam Brondon Forest Index, which was published in the AJO a couple of years ago. And we have an enhanced sensitivity and specificity considering the bad D. Interestingly, you have to look also at the impact from the procedure. And that's the work we are doing with the brain so that we have uh, enhanced ectasia susceptibility score that includes uh, the data from the surgery and age, and eventually you improve the sensitivity, but you still have cases down here that we cannot explain. So I come with the understanding that we need to go beyond. And I quote here, uh, uh, one of the most uh, important philosophers that we have, which is Socrates. And I would just humbly change that we, we know that we need to know more. That's what we have to acknowledge and accept and consider every day in our lives, that we have to evolve. And eventually evolving with the corneal shape analysis going to the biomechanics. My colleague and friend from Brazil, Canrobel Oliveira says, the bioelastometer or the, biochemical, the biomechanical evaluation is, is, is an exam from the past, from the old times of RK that unfortunately never existed. Today we have the Corvus, the Corvus is a non-contact system that does uh, 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 air puff and with the shine flug imaging have a very high uh, speed, ultra high speed shine flug camera that takes uh, three, 4,300 frames in a second. But in 31 milliseconds, we have 140 frames. And from those frames, you can monitor very nicely the deformation of the cornea and the velocity. And it's very important to understand that artificial intelligence can come very handy to use all this data so that you have a core vis corner biomechanical index that was published by Ricardo and Paulo Vinciguera. Our idea is to combine tomography and biomechanics. And we started that about 15 years ago when we started with the ORA and the tomography of Pentacam. And we have this case here in a patient that had LASIK in the left eye. The, the patient did not like the result uh, even though she was seeing well in the first week and first month, but she decided to wait on the right eye. The left eye got worse, and eventually she never had any surgery in the right eye. The right eye will qualify for LASIK based on topography and central corneal thickness, but when you see the bed and ambrosio and the hysteresis, this is a susceptible cornea. When you think about the integrated tomography and biomechanics, we have uh, this study that was published in the JRS in 2017, 
94 cases with normal topography based on strict criteria from patients that had ectasia in the fellow eye. Some of these patients had uh, the fellow eye, uh, ectatic eye with a procedure like cross-linking and, and rings from my clinic and from Paolo's clinic. We have 204 keratoconus cases and 440 normal cases as the controls. So we have a very nice separation from the normals and clinical keratoconus with the random forest approach and 90% sensitivity to detect these cases. You see some cluster here of cases and cluster here. Those are the cases that you want to avoid doing LASIK and eventually those may be the case with tinilatrectasia that we just discussed a little bit. Little bit. So this is a, a, a epitomize of the biomechanical susceptibility of the cornea. And this display is coming in the Ambrosio, Roberts, and Vinci Guerra tomography and biomechanics report that includes the random forest. And going back to the case that was published in 2010, this patient with 2015, you see a little bit of irregularity on the cornea if you change the scale and a little bit of a normality in the, in the elevation, the PRFI is 0 0.19, which is in the borderline range, but it comes very much easy to understand the susceptibility with a 0 0.78 of a TBI when you integrate the data. Very interestingly, this patient has ectasia susceptibility, which in my opinion is the same as foam thrust. Both eyes of the son of the patient has bilateral foam thrust. And even you have a little bit of irregularity here that classifies keratoconus based on the topometric criteria. This is the patient with 2020 and allergy that should be followed very carefully. And eventually they may need, this patient may need cross-linking. Both eyes can be abnormal in the twin sister. This is the twin sister with identical twin sister with both eyes, uh, normal topography, the second twin. All the four eyes with the same genes have abnormal TBI. So here is the, the, the first twin that rubs the eye, the right eye more than the left eye, and the second twin that admits she did not rub the eye at all. Interestingly, external validation studies were done and Universally, I can say that the TBI is the best parameter that we have, but it's not as good as we had in the first uh, publication and original series uh, in some studies, which gives us the opportunity to improve the artificial intelligence. Uh, artificial intelligence is a truly revolution in evolution, and we have to acknowledge the opportunity to improve, to optimize it. And the TBI optimization uh, with the brain group was done. And we started from less than 100 normal topography cases and now with over 500 in a uh, multi, uh, we had two countries, Brazil and Italy in the first study. And now we have uh, 12 uh, centers that collaborated in this, in this project so that we had a, an enhanced opportunity for AI optimization and improved from 75% to 85%. Those cases down here may be the true cases of unilateractasia. This is a very important concept. This is the perfect example of unilateractasia. This patient come uh, uh, to, to, to help get help in the right eye. The left eye has 20, 20 plus uncorrected vision, everything normal. And this patient moves to London for a follow-up. And this patient has a normal tomography with epithelial thickness, the segmental tomography, normal Damianga Tinella and Lansard score, and a normal TBI. And this is the unilateral ectasia case. Interestingly, we have cases like this one with 2015, the patient that has 27 years old. The tomography is a little bit borderline, but when you go to the TBI, looks very much uh, the abnormality here. This actually, the CBI in some cases is higher than the TBI, which believes that I believe that this is a very weak cornea that the patient is not rubbing very much. Interestingly, this is the fellow eye of a patient with a keratoconus, with a clinical keratoconus, a mild keratoconus. And she comes as a refractive candidate. She has 2025 minus two in the left eye. And this patient needs uh, to be understanding. That, that's the real case that we need to, to detect. So when we have uh, this situation of asymmetry, the very symmetric ectasia case, in this situation, we confirm that we had foam thrust in the, uh, in the normal topography eye. So the consensus gives us the opportunity to understand the concept 
And the concept is that true unilateral curvature corners does not exist. And I have the archetype of Yoda uh, that on the wisdom that we also can understand that ectasia can occur in a secondary to a mechanical process unilaterally. And this is very important that you understand this. So when we screen for ectasia risk, we have to understand artificial intelligence. And today with the TBI, I can get a refractive surgery toolbox and seeing the patient, how the patient is in terms of the susceptibility, if you can do LASIK, if PRK or subsublation, advanced subsublation, or even ICL is the best procedure, or eventually you are in the therapeutic domain that you may need cross-linking and uh, corneal rings, et cetera. The impact from the procedure is important. The relational tissue alter, we will uh, publish this soon. It's very important concept that we can understand uh, in a more detail, in a more uh, advanced and uh, in an enhanced uh, possibility to get a better accuracy for the understanding relation of the procedure. And of course, refractive surgery is an elective procedure. Uh, very quickly, I want to discuss placido dystopography. It's important. You see cases like this one, contact lens intolerant, but you see the tear film, uh, uh, no, no non-invasive breakup time is very important here. So this is a patient that can be correlated also with uh, Roger Zaldivar evaluation of the optical breakup time. And the tear film can be also understood in terms of the ev evaporative, the gl myeloma and gland dysfunction. Many of the colleagues that do cornea, they would point here, but the glands are here. And once you see this image, you can correlate this with the image that you have on the, on the back of the, of, the, of the tarsus. Segmental layer tomography is another concept. The epithelial thickness it started with Dan Reinstein in the, in the 90s with high frequency ultrasound and he was starting his brilliant career. And today we can do that with uh, segment, uh, uh, spectral domain OCT and the great work from David Huang and Yan Lee that also gave us the parent strain deviation, which is not unfortunately at the market. We have also the opportunity to see therapeutic procedures, the hyperplasia, and to the correlation of a mild subclinical keratoconus and more advanced keratoconus with a thinning pattern that is correlated to the area of protrusion on the cornea. This uh, also can be looked at uh, occult basement membrane dystrophy. You see the very thick basement membrane complex that you can see in OCD and eventually correlate with the red reflex image. And this patient will be a better candidate for surface ablation. You see how easy it is to remove the epithelium in this case. And I do believe you, don't, you should not do a, a flap or a smile because of high risk of epithelial problems in those cases. So multimodal imaging is related to customization, lens surgery. We have the ability to look at the uh, eye trace lenses function index and correlate that with the shine fluke image and also other metrics. For example, patients with hyperopia 2025 plus, they will better serve with cataract surgery. And Fuchs dystrophy can also be understood. The second hump of the Camel sign is very important that we correlate that with the presence of the higher reflex densitometry. Uh, anterior chamber evaluation, this is a narrow angle pre and post. And also cases like this one, this patient with 16 years old with um, irregular cornea, a little bit irregular, you can see high astigmatism and steep cornea, unquestionably steep cornea. And the patient was having a second opinion for keratoconus being long. His vision was not good. He was 2070, could not get better with, with this is correct vision. And no, even with a contact lens, that's very interesting. And the patient, was seen to have a normal tomography. If you see the tomography gives you the anterior chamber evaluation and you see asymmetry here, and this gets to be obvious when you dilate the patient. So the patient would never benefit from corneal cross-linking, maybe a zonal cross-linking if you, if you may develop such a procedure, but this patient gives you the point that you have to go beyond, beyond but not over, beyond but not over the cornea, beyond but not over the shape of the cornea, understanding the anterior chamber. Also in some other situations, posterior polar cataract, Alport syndrome, all of these uh, conditions can be a better seen, better understood and better planned when you do uh, multimodal imaging. 
the Maeda corneal uh, tomography display for cataract surgery gives you a lot of information about astigmatism and eventually you can plan the refractive cataract surgery the best way as possible. So refractive surgery is a great uh, subspecialty. Multimodal imaging gives you the opportunity for customized understanding the cornea, understanding if you're doing surgery interocular, if it's a therapeutic procedure. And uh, we have to go beyond and understanding the AI paradox. The role of multimodal imaging for individualized medicine is unquestionable, but even though with AI, we still have to be doctors, have to do humanized medicine, patient education plays a major role and understand the max uh, Hippocrates uh, medical mission statement that we heal a few times, we relieve often and comfort always. And that's the basic of our campaign, the violation campaign for public awareness and care of the conus. And I'm very happy to invite all of you to collaborate with that to spread a message about the disease so that patients may suffer less and understand that eye rubbing is bad for them. I also invite you to take a look at our work. We are launching next year a master class in which we go very much deeper in all the details that we discussed in this uh, presentation. So I thank you very much for the opportunity to collaborate with the Morocco Ophthalmology and I'm very honored to collaborate and I look forward to interacting and learning and exchanging information more with you soon. I hope all is well with, with all of you. We are praying for this pandemic to go over as soon as possible. We are very happy to see the success of the vaccines and very enthusiastic and optimistic that next year we'll come back to the real meetings and I hope to see you soon in a very safe manner. And God bless you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Best regards from Brazil.